welcome to Light Church Online. Thank you for joining us for today's message. That there is always a word from God that we should live by and conduct ourselves accordingly. Jesus said in Matthew chapter 4, Man shall not live by bread alone, but by every word. All right, so he didn't just mean in the bad times. Okay, in just a few weeks, we will join the rest of the nation in the celebration of the birth of Jesus. And that was a good time, wasn't it? I said, wasn't it? Yeah, so even though it was a good time, there was still a word from God. So no matter what the description is of what you're dealing with, there is a word that is given to us by God that is supposed to help keep us secure and keep us safe. So is the case in Acts chapter 27. This is a story that is, um, when you're reading it, and I encourage you to read chapter 27, Acts, when you're reading it, uh, depending on how you read and depending on what you do when you're reading. See, when I read, I like, if it's it's an action, uh, you know, if, if, what I'm reading is filled with action, I like to put myself into action. Now, y'all may not, but I do. Okay, when I was was coming up, uh, one of the books that I liked to read was Archie. Okay, so it was a comic book. It's still a book. And so so when I was, I would read Archie, you know, I would put myself in the action that uh, Archie and Jughead and okay okay that's just that's just me because if it's not real to me I'm subject to forget what I read and so one of the one of the keys I learned to remembering is if you're reading if it's particularly a story if you can interject yourself in there and, and identify with some or one of the characters, you're less likely to forget it. And so that's how I learned history. That's why I like history. It's one of my favorite subjects. But in chapter 27 of Acts, it is so filled with action. It is the story of the Apostle Paul who is being sent as a prisoner to Rome. And so the method of transportation is, of course, by sea. That time, you know, I don't have to tell you, if you were traveling uh, to a destination that you couldn't get there by horse or chariot, your only other option, uh, well, actually, you had two options. Either you could be supernaturally transported because we have record in the New Testament where Philip, for example, you know, he was supernaturally transported from one place to another. Gives a new meaning to the phrase, beam me up, Scotty. And so, and so if you couldn't, if you, if you didn't get supernaturally transported, the natural way to get from one destination to another, if there was water in between, is you had to go by boat. And so the, the sailors and the crew that were on this boat that Paul was on were professionals. They knew the seas that they sailed. They were familiar with all kinds of conditions. At this particular time of the year, storms were a regular occurrence. And so as Paul gets on the boat and they set sail uh, heading 
to Rome. They had several destinations that they had to dock in. And it was in the midst of his being transported that something happens that uh, should serve as a source of encouragement to you and to me. We are told that uh, at one particular place, a storm had come up, and Paul said to the crew, I think we probably ought to just stay right here and wait this storm out because I perceive that this storm, uh, if, we, if we sail in the midst of it, it's going to be detrimental to us and to the ship itself. And as professionals do often, you know, and you can't really criticize them, they decided that what Paul said was not really worthy to adhere to. So they set sail. What happens? This great storm comes up just like Paul said. Now, before, before, you, before you jump on the crewmen, okay, I think there ought to be some credibility given to the fact that their estimation was the dock that Paul suggested they stay in, in the crew's estimation, was not the best dock to stay in with the storm coming. And so it's not as though they just ignored what he said. They were well aware of the storm and the danger of the storm. They just determined that where to you know, hold up in the storm was different from what Paul suggested. So they set sail for the destination that they determined. And it was in the midst of them sailing there that this storm became more and more fierce to the point where they started having to throw overboard a lot of their cargo, a lot of the ship's equipment, and it got so bad that the scriptures tell us that they had lost all hope for ever successfully getting through this storm. Have you ever been in a situation where it just seemed like to you all hope is lost. That it's so bad that you're unable to recover from it. Well, if you've never been in a situation like that, then let me assure you, you probably ought to make some notes. And the reason I say that is because in this world, in this life, you're going to have storms. Amen. Isn't that what Jesus said? Amen. He said, let me show you what the person is like who listens to what I'm saying and obeys it. And then he goes on to say that there's a storm coming. And the person who obeys his word is the person that's able to successfully get through the storm. He did not promise that the storm would be diverted and go around to somebody else's place, Jesus said that the winds beat upon this house. Didn't he say that? He said the flood waters rose on this house. He said the rain came down upon this house. All right? And so when it comes to the wise and the unwise, it's not a question of, well, because I'm wise, I won't have to deal with no storms. No, that was not what Jesus said at the end of his Sermon on the Mount. What he said was that storms are going to come to the wise and the unwise. All right, so you can be a good Christian and still have to deal with a storm. <laughs> you can be a good parent and still have to deal with children that are sometimes disobedient, right? And, and, and while I'm at this point, let me just encourage you parents. Don't take your child's disobedience or rebellion as an indictment on your parenting. All right, I think this is the right group. So, so the storm comes up, 
Paul then gets a word, and I'm going to take it up in verse 25. <clears throat> verse 20, well, let me start at verse 21. Acts 27, verse 21. But after long abstinence from food, then Paul stood in the midst of them and said, Men, you should have listened to me and not have sailed from Crete and incurred this disaster and loss. And now I urge you to take heart, for there will be no loss of life among you. Everybody got that? All right, so what did he say? No loss. Of, so basically, what is he saying? You ain't going to die. Everybody's going to make it. That's what everybody say. Praise the Lord. But that ain't all he said. He said, but only of the ship. Now, what does that mean? Let me understand this. I'm on the plane. The plane is going down but we all going to make it. <laughs> we all going to make it. Is that what I'm hearing? Now, you got you to gotta, you gotta imagine that this would be hard for an unbeliever, let a, I mean a believer, let alone an unbeliever. Right? I mean, some of us have not done so well with significantly less crises. Huh? Even though we got a word from God. Let's, let's, let, let me give you an example. How, how many tithers in here? Don't raise your hand. <laughs> tithers and givers in here. You got a word from God, don't you? That the devourer. Huh? Who's going to do that? Didn't even say you had to rebuke him. It said, God said, I will rebuke the devourer. Isn't that what he said? That's a word from God. And yet, how many of you have not become frantic when it seems like financially we are facing ruin? So when you start talking about criticizing, let's not be so hasty to criticize because even for believers... In the midst of this situation, we have not fared so well. You're in a storm. The professionals have done everything that they could do and have concluded eventually we're going to die. And yet Paul says, cheer up, don't worry about it. There's going to be no loss of life, but the ship's going to crash. All right, so, so verse 23, he gives us the explanation. For there stood by me this night, this night, there stood by me this night. Now, you know, and I, I, this always happens to me, so y'all just have to indulge me. Or, or you know, I, I guess if you just need to leave, go ahead and leave, but I'm going to preach this thing. They had been in the storm for a long time. But Paul said, this night. Now, you got to keep in mind, this night was after several days and nights of them trying to do everything that they could to save themselves and the ship. Now, why it took this long for this night to happen, I don't know. Okay, I, I don't know, I don't have the answers to that, but I do know this, that when God issues instructions, no matter how it looks and no matter how long you may have suffered through a particular storm, 
at some point, attention has to be brought back to the word that God has given. See, even before this night that the angel shows up, Paul already received the word. Oh, okay, I got to show it to you because y'all looking at me real funny. All right. <clears throat> if you go back up to um, verse 20, no, let's see. Go back to chapter 26. And when Paul is standing before Agrippa, he appeals to Caesar, who was, of course, the emperor. And since he made that appeal, then he had to be sent to Rome where Caesar was to make his case before Caesar. But according to the scripture, it tells us, and I'm trying to locate it right here because y'all looked at me so funny when I told you that, so I want you to read it for yourself. Uh, it tells us that Paul was told, you will appear before Caesar. All right? And so when he's told that, this is before the storm. Then after the storm comes up, he is reminded that he's going to stand before Caesar. You understand? So we got at least two incidents where Paul is told, this is where you are going. The storm comes up, and it looks like Paul is getting ready to die with the rest of the prisoners and the rest of the crew. So then the angel shows up and says, this night. So as we were told last week, remember last week we looked at Jesus on three different occasions in the book of Matthew that told his disciples what was going to happen. Do y'all remember that? On three separate occasions, he told them what he was going to have to go through. And he told them how it would come out. So here in this text, the Apostle Paul is told, you're going to stand before Caesar. That was God's plan. All right? He's told that twice before the angel shows up. And so the angel shows up and says to him, look, God has reassured you that you are going to stand before Caesar. But not only has he made sure you understand that, that's in verse 24 of the 27th chapter. He said, but not only, not only is God praying on you, standing before Caesar, but there's something else that you need to know. And the reason you need to know this something else is because there's somebody else. All right, so, so standing before Caesar was one thing. You've got to understand, man, this is like you standing before the president of the country. Okay, if God says, you will testify about me to the president. All right, and then all hell breaks loose. You get arrested for threatening the government or some nonsense. You know, you said something crazy. You know, it don't take nothing these days. You know, I wish I would see the president. And, and then you hear that knock on your door. <laughs> you follow what I'm saying? And you leave in handcuffs. All right. And they, you, this is an outrage, you know, and you go through all your, your you know, anger fits and all of that. And, and you get locked up. And while you locked up, somebody in jail says to you, you know, the Lord told me you were supposed to go and, and witness to the president. Well, that's one time. Well, actually twice, because, you know, the first time you went crazy and said something and got arrested. And then the second time you're in prison and the prisoner gives witness to it. Okay? But then somehow you end up on death row. 
okay, because you did something while you was in there, got falsely accused of something, and so they sentenced you to death. So now you're on death row. All of a sudden, one night, you get awakened by a dream that says simply, don't worry about it. Oh, really? <laughs> I'm on death row when you talk, don't worry. But, but in the dream, there's a word that says you will surely stand before the president. All right? But not only that, God has given you the whole death row population. Now, I got to ask you a question that may be somewhat personal, but you need to at least consider it. What if some of the people on death row were molesters of children, murderers of innocent people? What, would, what if they were, you know, the, 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 as the Bible calls them, the lewd and baser sort? In other words, the worst of the worst criminals. All right? Would you be so willing to say, Lord, save them too? Y'all kind of quiet, man. Y'all could have said, go ahead on and preach, Reverend. What's next? What else you got? <laughs> because that's essentially the, the situation Paul's in. He's on board with a bunch of criminals. So much so that the Bible tells us when you read this that when they finally, finally got shipwrecked, that the crew said, we better shoot all the prisoners or kill them all so they won't escape. Does that sound reasonable? Because if the ship breaks up, and I know I'm fixing to face death, you know, would I be one to hang around and say, well, you know, uh, even though the ship broke up and, you know, we went through the storm and all that, I, I'm reporting for my execution. That sound like something you do? No, no. <laughs> no, you'd probably be like the fugitive, wouldn't you? Yeah, they'd be looking for you for a while. All right, so Paul is given, according to the scriptures, those, all of them, the crew and the prisoners, he's given their word for encouragement and assurance. The angel says, God has not only going to, he's not only going to preserve you, but he's going to also keep everybody on board. That's even the people that didn't listen to him when he told them we shouldn't sail. Right? That's probably, and you can imagine, that's probably some of the prisoners that were like the one that stood, or that hung with Jesus. Remember him? Look, man, if you're so bad, you know, hey, you ought to save yourself and us. All right? So there's probably some of them in this bunch. And yet the scriptures say the angel told Paul, not only are you going to be saved, but because of you, God's going to save all the rest of them. I wonder if that would be your attitude. Lord, save them too. Or would you be the kind of Christian that will say, well, see, if y'all have gone to church like I went to church. See, then God could have saved y'all. But no, y'all made fun of me because I was at church every Sunday. Y'all was watching the game. I wanted to watch the game too. But I, I, I was supposed to be at church. You know, if you'd have prayed like I prayed, y'all know how we get. If you knew the scriptures like I knew the scriptures. Yeah, see, if you'd have been that disciple you like I was, then maybe you would have gotten a word that could have saved you, but no, no, you had other things to do. But look at the mercy and the grace of God. But the reason they got saved in this storm was because of one man. Because if Paul hadn't been on that ship, everybody would have gone down. The reason that ship or the lives of the people on that ship were saved 
is because Paul was on it. In fact, if you read this story in its entirety, it tells us that the reason those prisoners were not killed when the ship broke up was because one of the officers wanted Paul to get to Rome so he wouldn't let the crew kill any of the prisoners. In other words, how easy would it have been for him to say, well, kill all them if you want to, but, but this one right here. And yet, that's not what the scripture says happened. Now, what are, we, what are we to learn in this? That you ought never, ever underestimate how important you are to God. You stop and think about it. One man, one man plunged the whole of humanity into sin. That's all it took, just one. But glory be to God. One man caused us to be redeemed. Are you listening to me? So, so I'm trying to help you realize that you are important to God if you stay true to him. Because he's not just trying to save you and your family. There are others that he wants to reconcile. And if you get right down to it, the scripture says all have sinned and come short of the glory of God. None of us deserved to be saved, but we got saved by grace. And so the scripture tells us in the 10th chapter of Romans how beautiful are the feet of those that bring me the good news of Jesus and his salvation. Don't you ever underestimate how important you can be to God if you stay loyal to him. Because while everybody else may be making fun of you and your relationship with the Lord and how you live it out, they may be some of the very people that, that you will be responsible for saving in the midst of the storm that life will carry them through. I can't tell you how many people have called that at one time poked fun at me, but they eventually called to ask for prayer. And I thank God that I didn't live before them in an arrogant way so as to make them feel like they could not call me. Amen. Church, look, you got to come off this high horse about, you know, who you think you are and what you deserve as, as opposed to what somebody else ought to get. Isn't it interesting that, that when it's your child, when it's your child, you want mercy. But when it's somebody else's child, you want them to be beaten. Huh? Yeah, when it's you on the highway, you want folks to understand that you got to get someplace and you got to get there in a hurry. But when it's somebody else cutting you off, you want the police to hurry up and pull them over and take their driver's license and their automobile. But we're talking about a man, the Apostle Paul, who says, I was the chief. I was the chief of sinners. I killed Christians thinking I was doing God a service. And now look at what God has been able to do because of who he represented. God was able to save all of the prisoners and all of the crew because of the Apostle Paul. Well, let me get through with this because there's only a couple of things that I really wanted to exhort you and encourage you with today, and that is that no matter what the situation is you may be going through, whether it's a storm or sunrise, whatever it is, there's always a word from God that's designed to keep us steady because often when we go through storms, the winds of life can blow us off course. And while you may be believing God and walking by faith at the beginning, because of the resistance that you get from adversities in life, it's easy to be blown off course. 
so that at one time, for example, you started out believing God, but now you're not so sure. But again, it's the same whether it's sunshiny out. Because often what happens is we start out believing God and we keep our faith where it needs to be because we're trusting God to get us to the bright sunshine. And then when we get there, we allow the success of that to blow us off course. So now, you know, we thank God or we say we thank God, but he can't get a whole lot of service out of us. Yeah, but, but, but when we were getting there, yeah, we was there at church, we was at Bible study, we was calling trying to find out what the scriptures are for tonight. Yeah, y'all pray my strength in the Lord. All right. And then when you got your strength, all of a sudden you were too tired to come give God praise. Too tired to say, thank you, Jesus, if it had not been for you on my side. So he always gives us a word, no matter what we are going through, to keep us steady, to keep us from being blown off course. Also remember that the word that we receive from him is not always, in fact, he told us that last week. The word that we receive from him is not always, listen to this now because it's going to throw some of you. It's not always a lock. Oh, see, now y'all ain't treating me right now, see. <laughs> the word that we get from him in the midst of our storms is not always a lock that it's going to be that way. We just learned a couple of weeks ago of one man, assistant to the king of Israel, who didn't believe what the word of God said about the economic times they were going through. The prophet said, in 24 hours, this situation going to flip. Y'all remember that? Yeah, and there was one man, the king's assistant, that said, I don't believe that. That can't happen if the Lord would open up windows of heaven. And the prophet said, you're going to see it, but you're not going to be able to enjoy it. Now, even though it was God's will for him to not only see it, but to enjoy it, he still had to believe it. Right? So that's why I say just because God wills it for you doesn't mean that it's a lot for you. It'll be a lot for those that believe it. How do I know? Because when we read this story, the crewmen were determined we jump in ship. And Paul said, I said that the ship is going to be lost, but if you stay on board, you'll be preserved. So everybody that jumps ship, you're not going to make it. Now, didn't we just read where the scriptures say God told Paul, I've given you all the people that were on that ship? So we know it was God's will for them to come through that storm without being killed, don't we? But yet, if they had jumped off the ship, what do you suppose would have happened to them? Yeah, so even though God wanted them to be saved, it wasn't a lock that they were going to be saved if they didn't follow the instructions that he had given them. So the word that we get, whether it's during our crisis or whether it's during the times when we are celebrating, the word that we get still must be obeyed if we are going to stay steady. For example, if, if, if you, you are tither and a giver in the church. Dang, man. I would have thought that would be time for y'all to stand up, all you tithers, to shout me down right then. Y'all, it just got deathly silent in the house. What y'all do, get convicted? If you are a tither and a giver. Oh, no, it's too late now. No, uh, no. No, 
Okay, if you're a tither and a giver, you know the promises God's made, right? What did he make? What promise did he make to you as a tithe and a giver? He would, re, he would what? He would rebuke the devourer. What else did he say he'd do? He's going to open the window. Didn't that, isn't that what he said? Isn't that a promise that he made to everybody that's tithing and giving? Didn't God say that? I said, didn't he say that? Are you one of those? All right, so then when trouble comes in terms of the economy, when trouble comes in terms of your employment, when that comes, when you receive the blessing of the Lord that he gave you because you are faithful in your tithe and your offering, that word he gives you has to be obeyed. Well, what are the, what are the instructions God gives to those of us who tithe and give after we have received blessings through the windows of heaven. Well, well what did he tell us to do? See, because if you think that, okay, I, I acted on the word. You did? Yes. What'd you do? I, gave, I paid tithes. I gave my offerings. Okay? And God did just what he said he was going to do. So now I'm going to praise God because the devourer was rebuked for me. I'm going to praise God because the windows of heaven, the windows of heaven are open to me and there's being poured into my life blessings in overflowing proportions. But what instructions did he give you once that happens? Did he tell you, well, now just, just you know, like the, what, what the Bible calls the rich food. So you've done much good. Tell you what you ought to do. Tear down your old barns and build some bigger barns and just kick back and just have your rest. Is that what he told you to do? What did he tell you after he has blessed you? It's too quiet in this Presbyterian church. Y'all don't know what he said. Well, let me tell you, let me tell you a few things that he said. He said, remember the Lord your God because it's he that gives you the power to get well. Wait a minute, wait a minute, wait a minute. So before you run out here shouting, okay, Lord, give me the power. Give me power to get well. That ain't all he said. He said, in order that what? He may establish his covenant, not your own ambitions. So, so you can get off course if you are receiving the blessing of the tither. Because that blessing can blow you or the, the effects of it can blow you off course to where you start thinking now because you got it all made because God has come through for you but you didn't follow the instructions and so what was intended to be a blessing for you can actually turn into a curse. What? Yeah. It'll blow up in your face. Wish I had time to go over into that. What was a blessing and turn around to be the source of your undoing. Why? Because the word that God gave you to help keep you steady so that you could enjoy the blessing, you didn't follow. And so because you didn't follow it, what was supposed to be a blessing for you turns out to be a curse to you. I've seen it happen, okay? People get bonuses and get extra income coming, and oh, they thank God and all that, but they don't follow on to do what God told them. And so what happens? Now, see, these are things that we don't think about, and 
it, out, it answers some questions about why things happen in our lives. Because you didn't follow what God told you to do, so you know what? Okay, now you got the tax man coming. I didn't know I had to file taxes. You know now. Oh, yeah, you know now. Yeah, so you went out and bought something, and that broke down on you. All kinds of things. Are you listening to me? When God said, if I bless you, this is what I am going to hold you responsible for. It's not just in bad times like we have in this text. Because in chapter 27 of Acts, this was not a good situation. But yet, God gives him a word to keep him steady. He gets this word, and it doesn't sound all of, it doesn't sound like common sense. I heard somebody say, common sense ain't always common. Wait a minute. You say we all going to be saved, but the ship's going down. That don't sound like common sense, because if I know the ship is going down, and I'm not the captain, so this, this boy ain't going down with no ship. But if you say stay on, can you imagine what it took to stay steady knowing that the ship you're on is going to be destroyed in the storm, but in order for you to be saved, you can't get off? Well, what, what do you imagine that took to stop yourself from jumping off? But yet, we walk by, by sight it looked like what you should do is get off. But faith says, I got to stay on. Sight says, it ought to be something else we can do besides stay here. But faith said, stay on. Faith says this ship can't save us. But faith says the God that I belong to that stood by me is able to do just what he said. And if he says stay on, though the ship can't save me, I know he will. Praise God. So whatever situation we're going through, there's a word from God for you. If you're in the midst of a great blessing manifestation, there's a word from God for you. You listen to that word. You follow the instructions of that word if you want to be kept in the midst of your blessing. If you're going through trouble, there's a word from God for you that's able to keep you and to preserve you. If you listen to that word and you follow those instructions, it'll bring you safely through whatever the crisis is onto the other side. Amen? Amen. Two things you got to learn to do. Number one, you got to learn to always focus on the peace of God because it's his peace that Jesus wants us to live in. He said in this world, you're going to have trouble. He understood that more than anybody else that you or I know. And yet he said, my peace I leave with you. Not the peace you find out there in the world, but the peace that I leave you, I'm leaving it to you. It'll, it'll keep you in the midst of your trouble. So you got to always focus on God's peace. Isaiah chapter 26 says, he will keep him in perfect peace whose mind is stayed on him. So you, gotta, you got to focus. It's not something he's going to do. You got to make that effort to keep focused on what he said because to focus on what he says is to focus on him. So if he told you, stay on the ship, then you got to keep focused on that. Wind swirling all around you. 
pieces of the ship flying because the ship is coming apart. But you got to keep focused. He said, stay on. He said, stay on. He said, I'll be saved if I stay on. All right, the ship tearing up, waves tossing it from one side to the other. And all in you is telling you, man, this ain't going to work, this ain't going to work. But you got to stay focused. He said, stay on. He said, I'll be saved if I stay on. Are uh, you listening to me? Yeah, you got to keep focus on what he said. Job lay off. Oh, man, this situation don't look good. But I'm a tither and I'm a giver. And he said he'd rebuke the devourer for my sake. So I'm not going to stop tithing and I'm not going to stop giving just because I got laid off. But everything in me wants to take my tithe. And the offering that I was going to give, everything in me is telling me to use that tithe to go pay my bills. But no, no, I'm staying focused on him and his peace. And he said, as a tither and a giver, he would take care of the devourer. And he would open the windows of heaven. So I got to stay focused on what he said. Are y'all listening to me? But not only that, not only must you stay focused on, on, on his peace, because that's what will keep you. You got to stay focused on his word. His word is everything that he is, has done, is doing, and will ever do. And just because it seems as though what he said is not coming to pass, you got to stay focused. You got to stay focused. That's why, that's why you got to stay, as they say, stay in the word. Okay, you can't just read it on Wednesday night before Bible study. You got to stay in the Word. You can't just hear it when you come in here on Sunday morning. You got to stay in the Word. Because if you stay in, if you're going through any kind of challenge in your life, there's a Word from Him that's designed to keep you in the midst of it. But you have to govern yourselves accordingly. Go ahead and stand. God is faithful. Life is a race but you don't have to run it alone. Take advantage of your help. Receive Jesus today, and he will help you with everything you're going through. God has a plan for you. The first step in that plan is salvation. Read Romans 10 and 9 and pray this prayer of salvation. God in heaven, I believe in my heart. You raised Jesus from the dead. I confess with my mouth, Jesus is Lord. Jesus, I call on you now for my eternal salvation. I receive forgiveness for all my sin. I accept your unconditional love. Thank you for receiving me. I submit myself to you. With you as my helper, I will live according to your plan the rest of my life. Amen. If you are blessed by today's message, we encourage you to give an offering. Simply click the Give Online link on the Light Church homepage. Thank you for tuning in this week. We look forward to you joining us during our next broadcast. Have a blessed week.